hey, this is me building a $3 million a year business in public. I always do these videos by starting on some YouTube comment Q&A, and that's just to give you guys some value. And then also it helps grow my channel because more comments means more engagement, more engagement means more people seeing my stuff. Then I do some building and strategizing in public before finally running through some growth stats on YouTube, Instagram, and my products. So I'm not going to be doing this today just because I'm waiting for a flight that I'm getting on in like, I don't know, an hour and a half or so. Um, oh, and we will be doing this, but it's just going to be mostly YouTube comment Q&A and then growth stats today. This is the main channel over here at 172.5K. And then this is the daily updates channel. I posted a very spicy video yesterday called what GPT-5 means for AI agencies and it pissed some people off. So I'm excited to go a little bit more into that. But if I scroll down here, um, these are all the questions that I've received over just the course of the last couple of days. So if you guys want me to answer your question, I do get to them eventually, just a matter of time, I usually answer five or 10 per day. Just um, add them as a comment on below any one of these videos and I'll eventually circle back and answer. Okay, so let's see. What is the oldest comment that we have here so I can start the Q&A? Looks like it's from Eddie LaCrosse who says, I have a question on Upwork. There are many clients who request not to work with agencies. What is your experience with us? Well, first of all, great question. Um, yes, most clients on Upwork do not want to work with agencies specifically. And so my recommendation is not to use Upwork as the thing that you use to grow your agency. It's just the thing that gets you an initial foothold and when you're still at like the freelancing side of your career. So if you think about it, you know, if you spend a bunch of time selling somebody on you, you know, your freelancer profile, your profile picture, your work experience and stuff like that, the last thing they want to hear is, hey, our agency will help you because now they're like, well, dude, you just sold me on you. I want to work with one of your lackeys. I want to work with you. If I didn't, why the hell would I have watched the last 15 minutes of the Loom videos they've been sending me, right? So my recommendation is do not sell people as, a, as an agency on Upwork. Avoid any agency language whatsoever. You can certainly put founder at whatever on your profile, and you can certainly talk about it when you actually get them on a call, but do not in the slightest frame it as somebody else will be doing your work, okay? Instead, what I recommend, if you do want to eventually, I don't know, uh, take somebody and then build an agency relationship with them on Upwork, is you start as a freelancer, and then on your second, third, or fourth project together, your follow-up project, mention how, mm, you know, I'm considering looping in a consultant that does X, Y, and Z. Is it okay if they join the call? I'm considering looping in a colleague that is very proficient in whatever specific thing that you are asking. Is it okay if I loop him into the call? Then, you know, you can start introducing them to other people in your business, and then you can start growing that way. But yeah, um, you do not want to specifically mention that you are going to hand people off on Upwork. Uh, you want to work with them yourself. You want to get that first project gone, uh, nailed. You want to get a super high quality review, and then you want to take it from there. Grateful guy is saying I made a lot from that, probably just because yeah, I think he misinterpreted the question. But um, yeah, like I specifically say in Maker School, do not write like I own an agency called blank. Anytime somebody asks me for an Upwork request, I almost always tell them like, hey, you should re-record the video not to include this. The stats are very clear. Uh, we've run them multiple times and we see them on people that say stuff like, hey, I'm an agency that does blank versus people that are just like, hey, I'm an AI automation specialist and I care a lot about blank. Um, you know, incontrovertible evidence at this point. People on Upwork just don't like the term agency. Okay, hey Nick, how do you deal with a cold email campaign that has high bounce rates? Running the campaign for two to three days and I try to let it run for a few more days, thanks. With high bounce rates, a couple things you can do, okay? One, you can... Um, I guess there's a few things that you can do. Let's just focus on the big thing. Um, just um, verify your email list. So depends on how you're generating your list, but there are a variety of different ways to verify. Basically, there are these third-party tools out there, uh, mails.so, uh, million verifier, and never bounce, these sorts of tools. And the way that they work are they basically allow you to very quickly and easily validate or verify an email. And so this is mails.so. You end up with a deliverable score here, um, 50 to 75, I guess in this case, like 62.5 or something. Uh, well, that's lower than that, 57.5 probably. It's early. Um, and then you can take this and then you can define some sort of minimum validated threshold. And then if it's under, then you just like don't send the email. And then if it's over, then you just say, okay, yeah, like we'll send the email. Um, if you do this, like, I want to say like 50% or more of all those bounces just disappear. And Mails.so currently has 50 free credits. In Maker School, we were giving, um, I think, like 250,000 credits for a little while. I don't think that that's still available, but I think we have other deals in um, the deal aggregator for email verification tools that allow you to get like many, many thousands of credits. But yeah, you have to verify your emails if you really want to send it scale. So my usual recommendation is I'll start off by just like spamming, not spamming, but I'll start off by blasting a bunch of emails out. Uh, maybe one or two thousand, just to verify which niches are absolute trash and don't don't like me, and and which copy uh, 
audience combinations are just like very poor. And then I'll take the winners. And then if I scale up the campaign, I see, you know, some sort of promising result, then I'll start verifying. And that way I only pay for verified emails for campaigns that I know are going to work. If that makes sense. Shethan says, Hey, Nick, love the content you're putting out. My question is, how do you come up with ideas for YouTube? Oh, that's a great idea. Um, well, maybe I'll make a YouTube video about it. <laughs> just kidding. Well, that's how I do it. I basically just look at YouTube comments, see what people are asking. And then I just make YouTube videos about those ideas. Uh, it's one of the quickest and easiest ways to go about things. And then also makes your audience feel very listened to. You know, one of the reasons these Q&As are so valuable is because I'm just listening to you guys and I'm like answering your questions, right? So there's a little bit of a back and forth that's significantly more engaging than you just watching somebody talk about stuff that they want. Could you share your advice on maintaining consistency to reach your goals? Yeah, um, I just like to minimize friction at every step. So I don't actually do like the hardest part of my day first. I start with the easiest parts of my day. And the easiest part of my day right now anyway is just responding to community questions. It's like very low effort, very low friction, and it just like wakes me up. And by the end of like, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, I'm already done a substantial part of the highest ROI part of my day. From there, I like ramp up to harder tasks. And then after an hour or so, I'm in flow. See, I guess we got a couple things there, but to unpack, I just do the most important stuff like within the first couple of hours of my day. And then I always just like start and get into work by minimizing friction. Um, if you just make it a daily habit as opposed to like a weekly habit or whatever, I find it's much easier to stick to as well. There's a lot of like biological reasons why, but like the neurobiological basis of uh, like habit forming and consistency, a lot of it is based on your circadian rhythm. Um, to make a long story short, you just have like fluctuations and chemicals in your brain that occur over the course of the day. And if you just do stuff at the same time every day, you tend to get better and better and better at those things over a long enough period of time. So I'm going to count that as my biggest productivity hack as well. Thank you very much for the questions. Acme Wong says, I'm loving these updates vids and I think shortening them is understandable. So I transition out of my mini golf business and launch an agency. I want to build in public like you. Do you think that'd be a good use of my time? Side note, what software are you using to record OBS? Yeah. I think this would be a reasonable use of your time, but I would encourage you first to do cool stuff and then talk about it afterwards. If you have some sort of big accomplishment in uh, your mini golf business, if you made a ton of money, if you are well recognized or well known, then you can definitely create content about it. I wouldn't start creating content until I had something really big and just something notable about me. It's as Alex Hormozzi always says, you know, do cool shit and then talk about it. But it's not like do cool shit water or talk about doing cool shit and then do the cool shit. It's like, no, 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 like do cool shit first, talk about it afterwards, because that's really the only thing that keeps you apart from the millions of other people that are trying to talk about it, right? If I didn't have um, income on the order of forty to $50,000 a month on average when I started this whole YouTube thing, I would not have been notable enough for anybody to give a crap about me. I probably would have needed to put in 10 times the massive action. I was already putting in massive action. Uh, likewise with more or less everything in your life. So yeah, you know, I think if you transitioning out of your mini golf business because you've hit some big figure and you can say, you know, I made $3 million starting a mini golf business. Um, here are the three things you don't know about mini golf, <laughs> you know, dive into it. That's inherently interesting because you're an authority in that space. But if you don't have anything like that, probably not a good idea. Go make a name for yourself outside of just content and then start talking about it later. Okay. Arcs Drive says, great fit for voice AI agents and workflows. What kind of niches would you recommend? I was thinking local businesses, but in a previous video, you said you would stay away from local businesses. No, I mean, you know, there's some nuance there. I would definitely stay away from local businesses um, just in general, because I think they're way less scalable and you don't get um, very straightforward access to like local leads, nowhere near as straightforward access as you get to like fully digital leads, for instance. But, uh, you know, it's not that I would like stay away from them. If you're selling voice agents or whatever, a lot of the time, um, local businesses are actually your best bet. Why? Because they're very high volume, because there are very big consequences if they don't pick up the phone or handle uh, an inquiry right, right then and there, because it's very search intent. It's very needs based. And then three, um, the relatively low average order value. Usually this isn't always true, but usually, and the reason why that matters is because if the business that you are reaching out to has a very high average order value, then the um, impact on opportunity cost of losing even a percentage point of your conversion rate by switching over to an AI voice agent as opposed to having a person in the loop means you lose more money than you save. So you might save 2000 bucks a month, but the opportunity cost will lose you $20,000 a month. And that's not a trade that I would make. What's going on, rock and roll CEO? Believe you are, is that Mustafa? I think that's Mustafa. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, you've been with me for a while, man. Thank you very much. Andy says, my theory is that you've scaled so quickly, not because you're good at ad, but because of your voice. And now the Superman curl. <laughs> That's nice. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate that. I'm sure part of it is actually voice related for sure. 
um, definitely. And also the usage of Ophonic was really cool. So somebody in uh, one of my, well, my, my earliest community, Make Money With Make, put me on this tool called Ophonic. He was asking how to automate his podcast. And he was like, I'm considering using this tool. I was starting to have API support. How would you do it? So I just answered a couple of questions for him. And then I looked into the tool. I was like, hey, dude, um, can you tell me a little bit about your experience with this? And he was like, dude, it's the easiest thing ever. Like AI mixes and masters your voice. And I was like, no way. So I gave it a try on one of my flows on one of my videos. And I was like, I sound even better than I normally sound. And I sound pretty freaking good. So I combined the two. And then yeah, one of the one of the immediate consequences of that was my watch time increased by like a minute or something. And my watch time before was like six minutes. So it's like 16% more pleasant or interesting to listen to. So if you think about that, that sort of stuff stacks up big time when you're publishing like 40, 50 min uh, minutes of video a day, right? Okay, anyway, um, Quick question about warm-up email purchase. I know that my target niche or industry uses Microsoft. Should I be prioritizing buying Microsoft mailboxes? Seems default across the services are Google. Yeah, the default across the services are definitely Google. I would go 50-50. Um, you know, there's actually weird quirks of deliverability. Sometimes like Microsoft and Microsoft inter or intra-network deliverability is lower for whatever reason. I don't know. We just saw this uh, a couple of weeks ago. So maybe hedge, go 50-50. Um, you know, and you may think this, but there are... There's no better way to know than to actually just like send a bunch of emails and then see, and then run like placement tests on instantly. Zaid says, hey, Nick, can you help me generate an offer for my AI voice agency? Currently I'm offering 24-7 lead capture, no missed calls. That seems pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, 24-7 lead capture, no missed calls. I would guarantee some sort of uptime. Uh, guarantee, you know, that you will take a certain number of calls. And then if you don't take a certain number of calls, or if there are any issues in your first 100 calls, they get like a full you know, they don't pay or something like that. Um, it's a little bit early and my brain is not exactly firing on all cylinders, but you know, if we don't generate you 10 X, Y, and Z in, um, um, a certain amount of time. So if we don't generate you 10, um, opportunities in 30 days, let's say you don't pay a cent. It's 24 seven lead capture. You'll never miss a call. Um, we have automated rerouting and upselling and blah, blah, blah and we'll install it in your business completely free in less than five minutes all it'll take is a quick phone call to get going something along those lines hey nick great video today when are we going to see that handsome face irl depends where are you who knows some people might be seeing me right now creeping outside my windows al bosch says how do you establish authority when you first started the channel did you have results from running a similar business to what you teach or was the community your first ever successful business and you just taught the knowledge you had from consuming lots of content no definitely not um i did have results from running a similar business yeah hopefully it's clear at this point that um my answer to acme is basically entirely contingent on this if you want to grow any sort of social presence i highly recommend that you have something really cool that you have done before something at least that members of your audience would find valuable so I did have uh, results from running a similar business and multiple businesses before and then failing at like, you know, another 20 or 30 of them. Fake one gives me a heart. Thank you very much, Harshit. Thank you very much, Ryan Lord. Getting a lot of thank yous. Thank you. Hey, Russ. He says, I've been using the Rise app since it was mentioned in Maker School, but I haven't really figured out how to configure it. Know how to start a focus session. I feel like I'm only scratching the surface. Could you just give us a rundown of how you use it and anything that'd be good to know? You know, I still haven't set it up since I moved over um, environments. Sorry about this, but to make a long story short, yeah, there are a couple things that I'll do. Um, one, I'll exclude certain apps. Um, they're just some certain apps that I don't want to have tracked by Rise, and so I just exclude them. Um, I will daily... So maybe at the end of every day, at least for your first couple of weeks, like categorize, because it will not know the categories of a variety of things that you do. Um, you might access school and it'll think school's entertainment for whatever reason. Uh, well, go in there and then rewrite school so that it's not entertainment. It's, I don't know, networking or something along those lines. If you don't do this constant recategorization, eventually your rise time will actually just become uninterpretable and it's kind of a waste. And then the third is use the AI coach feature. And like be consciously, uh, be intentional about how you set up the AI coaching feature. So what I mean by that is um, they have this little thing where if they see that you are supposed to be focusing and it'll automatically start a focus session after a certain amount of time focusing on one task, very useful. If they see that you are focusing or working on something that is not within the categories that you set for the focus session um, template, then a little ping will pop up and say like, hey, we noticed you've been on your email for the last 30 seconds. Um, is this what you really want to be doing? And the whole idea is it just adds a little bit of friction in order to continue doing your emailing as opposed to like the high value shit you should really be doing. And that actually makes a very big difference to your productivity. So I really like the AI coach feature, would highly recommend it. 
Okay, Jack says, how selective are you about the platforms you choose to integrate on the client end? I've worked with several clients who use Salesforce, and while services like Make do have integrations, identifying an account for hidden workflows has proved five times more painful compared to working with other CRM project tools, because there's so many unintuitive ways Salesforce can be configured. Tell me about it. That's why I stay away from it like the plague. I'm considering declining Salesforce link jobs to focus on higher ROI ones. Is this just a skill issue of mine, or are you so selective on a platform basis? I think it depends on where you are in your career. I wouldn't take a Salesforce project right now unless Salesforce is just my bread and butter and it was what I was doing all day. But at the beginning, at the start line, I definitely took you know projects like Salesforce projects that I was not entirely confident in, and it, as you mentioned, proved quite painful. So you know, I think if you're running an established, high quality, successful business, and you're making twenty thousand dollars a month or something like that, and you're crushing, you know, I might. Um, I might stay away from projects that are outside of the domain of my expertise. But if I'm at the start line, I would focus on skill acquisition more than anything else. And part of that skill acquisition would involve learning platforms and muddling through a bunch of shit that I might not be entirely comfortable doing so. So that is my take on it. I don't have any explicit exclusions aside from like enterprise stuff like Salesforce um, right now. What I'll usually do is I will just look at the platform and see that it fits into a similar category as other platforms that I've used. Like for instance, CRMs. How many CRMs are there really? You know, how many different CRM methodologies are there really? There's like two, maybe three, right? There's status based. Um, and then there's uh you know, subtask based essentially. And there are a couple platforms that are better at subtask based, a couple platforms that are better at status based. So just pick up status based one and then odds are, you know, Monday.com, click up and stuff like that. They're all they're all very similar insofar that they're uh, status based um and you know as a result of that like i can do mostly most of the same things i can do on monday on, on ClickUp. so hopefully that illuminates things a bit little joke break when nick wants to get serious somebody sends a calendly link that is 100 percent true <laughs> uh looks like zayed saying awesome seeing you with hormozy and ovens crazy how far things have come thank you i appreciate that quick question on pricing working on a small mma gym that's using Airtable to manage members the issue is over 25% of people train even after their membership expires. There's no proper check-in system. Thinking of using a QR-based check-in system where each member has a code tied to their number and coaches scan it to verify before class, what kind of pricing framework would you suggest for a solution like this? Yeah, solid question. Um, hmm. QR-based check-ins are fine. You having to scan it before every class is kind of annoying. Can you just set up a QR code on the front door? Alternatively, could you have a simple guest list that the coach just looks at before the class to verify the person is supposed to be in there? It really depends on the volume of the gym. Um, I think the second one is probably the simplest and easiest way to do it. But the first one is like, you know, more, I don't know, I guess scalable because it doesn't actually involve the time of the person. So one of those two is, um, is what I would do. Okay, last one from B3 Anna. Hey, Anna. Hey, Nick. Recently made a big money, make money online gurus that 2025 is the last year where it's going to be easy to make money online. Do you think that's true? Who said this? I feel like it is pretty scary. As we are all in on AI, we know how pretty much AI replaces millions of jobs too. Maybe the government would start restricting it. You need licensing and such as the theory of barrier entry is at an all-time low and won't be for very soon, right? Lots of pressure. Uh, yeah, but to be honest, like at the point where AI can do everything that we do, none of this stuff really matters, right? I mean, the economy itself is a joke. I mean, if it thinks a million times faster than I do, what sort of economic utility do I have in that economy? None. But the good news is, so does the biggest genius on planet Earth. Like the the gaps are so like small, relatively speaking, between me, him, and then a monkey or something that like none of this shit really matters. So, would I worry too much about it? No. Uh, the thing is, we are not there yet, and so there is certainly opportunity to be had this year, next year, and the next year. Um, I could see certain things growing more difficult, but I would not just paint it all with a broad brush. Okay, I'll leave it there. Last thing I'll mention, I guess, is Rodrigo is now in Maker School, great senior. Let's do some brand stats, and then let's get the hell out of here. So August the 8th today, looks like we've grown pretty little on the main. We just went up five subs. The reason why is because I'm just recording this pretty early, right? The second channel here is now at 11428. So you can see we had a massive spike in views after I posted what GPT-5 means for AI agencies. That's actually getting more views than on my main channel now, which is hilarious. Not like all, but yeah, like I gained almost 300 subs because of that, right? And let's do my Instagram at 303241. Pretty exciting. Um, got some cool content stuff in the works for you. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this blurry, shitty lighted, shittily lit video. I'll catch you all tomorrow.